There we go. We're live. We did it. At least according to this little red badge on here that says live. So hello, everybody um, that's watching on Facebook and uh, everybody that um, watches us uh, later on whenever you have a chance. My name is Jason Norman. I am Programs and Events Coordinator at the Writers Guild of Alberta. And um, we're trying out some new uh, new ways of getting uh, the word out about our Alberta Literary Awards. And um, so tonight we have some ver from the um, Wilfred Eglison Award for Nonfiction. So we have Sharon Wood and Richard. that are going to be, you can see their little face there. I didn't think you can see their faces there. And uh, they're going to be reading uh, from their uh, shortlisted books. And um, for anybody watching, if you, uh, if you have any questions for uh, any of the writers, um, as we, as we go, you can type them in the, in the, the chat box there. And, and maybe uh, whenever you, when everything's done, uh, we might have some time for a question or two. So, um, let us get started with our first reader for tonight. I see the numbers on the viewing thing going up, so people are tuning in. Um, so, Sharon, you're going to be first today. So, in 1986, Canadian Sharon Wood became the first woman from North America to climb Mount Everest. Her success on Everest catapulted her into an accidental career story is a testimonial to the power of teamwork, commitment, and the potential we all possess to realize extraordinary results. Wood's memoir, Rising, was 30 years in the making, which she believes was the requisite time for this universal story to steep in introspection and life experience. Sharon resides in Canmore, Alberta, and divides her time between guiding, climbing, mountain lifestyle. So Sharon, we were just talking about your active mountain lifestyle. Right? Yes. There's a bit of a delay sometimes. We've got a bit of okay. a glitch. That's okay. Okay. So um, I guess there's there probably isn't much more to, to say when you, uh, the first sentence in your bio is became the first Canadian woman to climb Mount Everest. So... But do you want to tell us a little bit more about, about the book and maybe about the, the passage you'll be reading from? Yeah, um, sure. Thank you, Jason. First of all, I'm just, uh, I'm just thrilled to, uh, that, that Rising has been recognized as a story that goes beyond mountain literature and uh, to a broader scope of, of readers. So thank you very much. Um, Rising is uh, my memoir centered around my experience in climbing uh, Mount Everest. but um, yeah, allow me a short preamble before I start reading. Um, this book has Everest all over it. See, there's a mountain, the climber on the summit, and uh, the first Canadian woman to climb Mount Everest. Uh, but due to some complicated reasons I won't go into right now, uh, and for the sake of time, initially I felt a little embarrassed about writing a book about anything to do with Mount Everest because it's such a beleaguered mountain, right? It's been written about a lot and there's way too many people on it. And, and, um, but uh, here's the thing is, is, is I uh, really wanted to write a book about mountain adventure that I hadn't read yet. And because usually I don't read mountain literature, I find it really boring, but uh, uh and, and the one that I haven't read yet is one that gets to underneath the adventure to explore what I thought, what I feared, and what I what, what, what fulfilled. And I believe these are, are pretty universal questions, regardless of our pursuit. And my need to engage in these questions was the irrepressible engine for, for writing my story. And so, first of all, I just have to say, I just have to get this out of the way because it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of an elephant in the room. I've, I've never really, I've never done this before, right? And I was just caught by my esteemed colleagues and finalists talking to myself because I hadn't turned off my, um, 
my speaker. So um, with that said, um, bear with me and, and I'll do the best I can. So I'm going to read you an excerpt from part one, which, which speaks to what I most feared. So uh, I was with a small Canadian team uh, of, of 11 climbers, and we'd all set out aiming for the, t the summit. But 67 days in and at an altitude, at, at, at high altitude, stringing out miles of fixed rope, and stocking five camps had whittled us down to just a few left who could take the rest of the team to the top. And, and much to my amazement, I was one of those few, along with Dwayne Congdon, my summit partner. And on this day, Dwayne and I are going for the summit. And we're at the base of the yellow band, which is the crux of the long climb and, and the moment of truth. I can't visualize rock climbing in sub-zero temperatures with crampons on my feet and a 14 kilo pack on my back and at an elevation above 8,300 meters. But what I can easily imagine are several good reasons to turn around, reasons that anyone will accept. We're out of time, we're spent and in unsafe conditions. When I turned to deliver my this isn't our time speech, Dwayne thrusts the end of the rope at me and says, your lead. Bless him, I think. He knows we're in this together and he's got to get me into the game. And I accept his gift of confidence and tie into the rope. Dwayne is anchored to the rock and prepared to give me a make-believe belay. We both know the rope will not hold a fall. It is only strong enough to descend on. Instead of climbing rope, we're using a static cord slightly thicker than a boot lace. It will snap under an abrupt load, sever over an edge, or it won't absorb the shock of a fall, and will rip the anchors out, and that will be the end of us. I crank my oxygen regulator up to a four liter per minute flow, the highest yet. As Kevin's voice, one of my teammates, echoes in my mind. What's the worst thing that can happen to us by trying this? I'm gonna take you out of this reading for a second because this is an insane question, I know. But, but let me give you some context. Kevin was with us the day before, giving us all and helping us carry loads to the highest camp on the mountain. And that morning, we were facing what I perceived to be impossible odds. Gale force winds, 30 plus kilo packs on our back, and soon we'd be climbing off the end of the ropes and we'd be risking a 5,000 meter fall. And the thing is, I'd made my mind up that it would be impossible to go on before I'd even put my pack on my back that morning. And that's when my Kevin, uh, that's when my teammate Kevin had asked me, what's the worst thing that could happen to us by trying this, by just beginning? And before I could answer, he did by saying the worst thing that could happen to us is by not trying this at all and to wonder for the rest of our lives whether we could have done it. Okay, so let me take you back to the reading. Dwayne's confidence, the oxygen, Kevin's prod, and a doable plan to make three moves upward are enough to get me started. The alternative, to fail without trying, will leave me wondering until the end of time whether I could have done this, my greatest fear. If the climbing is too difficult to tell myself, I can still back down. Dwayne hands me the carabiners loaded with pitons and says, on belay. Just three moves, I think, then I'll know. My focus narrows to a single action at a time. I reach up to probe the depth of an edge and pull down to test it. I tease my crampon points into a horizontal fissure, not deep enough. I try a little farther over to get a better purchase. I ease my weight onto the new foothold and step up. One, I say aloud. My mind chatter hushes as a benevolent voice begins to coach me with patient precision. 
Okay now, bring your ax up, reach high and wedge it in that crack. That's it. Now pull down. Ah, it seats nicely. Move up on it. Now bring your other foot up and try putting it just there on that block. The hollow sound that my crampon points make on the rock tells me it's loose. I try putting my foot on another rock and it shears off. A loud crack rings out as the block hits the side wall below. And that voice comes in again. That's all right. You're okay. That's what the other three good holds are for. Keep going. I stop counting. Then the voice says, you're doing it. You're climbing perfectly. Something beyond me is propelling me upward. Part one is about all it took to get to the top of the mountain. Then there is the part no mountain literature writer seems to write about, which is coming down and integrating the experience into what we call normal life, which I call part two, which was the hardest part for me, and uh, which was full of surprises. And I'll just read you a brief uh, excerpt from part two. Chatter and laughter echo off the walls if we, as we stride down the arrivals corridor at the Vancouver International Airport toward our families, lovers, and friends. After three months away, all we can talk about is the first things we'll do when we get home. Most of us are dreaming of food, real food, like a big, juicy steak. But because we all weigh eight to 10 kilograms less than when we left. I am daydreaming about soaking in a steaming bubble bath and sipping on a cold glass of Chardonnay when ahead, the exit doors slide open. My stomach drops and I stall, causing the other travelers to eddy around me. Jim, our leader, bumps up against me and leans in and says, it's showtime, Woody. I catch a whiff of shaving lotion and notice he has changed into a clean white t-shirt and his Everest light team jacket for the, for the occasion. Jim is bringing everyone home alive, and it dawns on me that this is his summit day. As our team steps across the threshold, the clapping begins. Flashbulbs pop. A woman reaches out, clutches Jane's arm, thrusts a microphone in her face, and asks, Are you the woman? Jane looks back at me. No. She is the one. She shoots me a raised eyebrow as if to say, are you ready for this? From all directions, camera-ready reporters shout questions at me. Did you ever think you were going to die up there? And of course, always, did you ever see any dead bodies? The arrivals lobby clamors with media teams and I am pulled from one interview set to another. I look beyond this sphere of frenzied hubbub and lights and see my teammates reuniting with friends and family. Later, I will regret how these first days unfolded. I will wish that I had paused to look into my mom's tearful eyes and lingered to hear what my father whispered after he said, welcome home, mouse. I will wish that I had greeted Chris, my future husband, standing quietly to the side of it all, holding a dozen roses. But wide-eyed and stunned, I comply with the media's requests, swept up in their urgency to show and tell. Thank you for listening, and thank you for acknowledging my story. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was fantastic. <laughs> Very good audience. Very good audience, Richard. That was, um, that was so good. <laughs> No, it was excellent. It was excellent, uh, an excellent reading. Absolutely. Congratulations on finalist for for this award. That's that's great, Richard. Let's move on to Richard Kemick. Richard Kemick is an award-winning poet, journalist, and fiction writer. His nonfiction book I Read takes readers backstage and undercover at one of the world's largest religious events. He is also the author of Caribou Run, a collection of poetry. Having published widely in all three genres, Richard's work has been included in anthologies in Canada and the United Kingdom. 
He is the recipient of multiple awards, including two National Magazine Awards and the Writers Guild of Alberta's 2019 Howard O'Hagan Award for Short Story. So, Richard, what is this religious event that the I Am Herod is about? Um, each each year in Drumheller, uh, in like this massive theater, uh, outdoor amphitheater, uh, it's the country's largest theater. There's a passion play put on each year, which is a play about the life and, and death of, of Christ. And like the size and spectacle of this thing is unreal. And I was also shocked by, like I grew up in Calgary and I had never heard of this play, which, which struck me as so odd because it is so momentous and it takes place year after year, but it kind of operates in like relative obscurity for those not a part of that community. And I'm not religious, so I, so I didn't really know about it this whole time. Um, yeah, so I just, I thought I, actually, I, I, so I wanted to write about it and then I contacted the play's leadership and asked, like, and then I kind of pitched them this idea of, okay, how about I audition? And if by chance I get in, then I can write <laughs> it from the inside. And I am, so since I'm not religious, nor an actor, I expected to get like <laughs> Villager 7. Uh, but but I, I wound up getting the role of Herod, who's kind of like the bad guy of the New Testament. Um, yeah, yeah. So then, I so that's that's kind of what the book is about in the in a in a nutshell. And um, so, what what's the the passage that you're gonna, or what are you gonna be reading from uh, sure. tonight? Uh, I've uh, okay. So I chose a passage that's kind of like um, so, okay. So we rehearse all like kind of spring and summer. The t the play takes place in the summer. Um, so we rehearse all, all through the spring and summer, and I've chosen something that's kind of uh, later on in the in the rehearsal process, and things are not going well. All actors in the play, I, sh I should also mention, are volunteers, with the exception of like Jesus and Gabriel, who make cash. Uh, but everyone else is a volunteer. So at th this part in the book, we've been rehearsing all summer, and it's not it's not going splendidly. All right, we'll take it away. Cool. Thanks, Jason. Thank it's a real honor to be here. I, it's, yeah, it's really nice. Uh, okay. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I'm, fuck, sorry. I should also mention, um, I'm sorry for swearing. Also, I, uh, all characters in the play, uh, in, in the book, are referred to by their character names. So, Jesus understudy is Jesus understudy, Pontius Pilate, etc. With the exception of just a couple who you need to know, uh, Barrett is the is one of the two directors, and Jessica is the other director. <clears throat> After morning warm up, the stage manager makes an announcement. Alrighty, everyone. Small change of plans. We're going to practice the sheep sacrifice a couple times before we start with the rest of rehearsal. Again, herbalist says, you men are killing those sheep every day. The sheep, they're like their live sheep that we use on stage. We don't actually kill them. That's the magic of theater, uh, but they're live sheep. And I did not know a lot about sheep before this production, but I can tell you that they hate being on stage. Okay. Uh, Jessica always participates in morning warmups. Barrett, however, believes warm up to be beneath him and peers down at us from the benches of the fourth row, his well gelled cowlick like the brim of a baseball hat against the sun. This script, Pontius Pilate said the other day, is all about the glorification of Barrett. But if such be true, glory comes at a high cost. I sit beside Barrett. You got a minute? I've got as many as this lasts, he says, nodding to the stage, where Jessica has assembled her gang of Galilean men, each of them holding a rope leash attached to a sheep. How are you liking this season, I ask. It's going well, he says. We're a bit behind in some areas, but it always comes together. Except for last year, I say. Uh, so, okay, sorry, just a quick note. Last year, 
like the the year before that I joined the play, the play like imploded on itself, and it, it nearly spelled bankruptcy for the um, company. So there's like an an abnormal amount of pressure riding on this year to not just be good, but like exceptional to to get the play you know back to where it once was. Over the course of the summer, a pattern has emerged within the co-director team. Barrett directs the scenes that have main characters, like Jesus, Simon Peter, or me, Herod. Jessica directs the scenes that feature those lost to the annals of history, like the singing fishermen, or the sacrificing of the sheep, or the genealogy sequence. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry, just a quick note. The genealogy sequence, in the New Testament, for those of you unfamiliar with the work, it, the, there's a book in the New Testament that starts by listing the genealogy of everyone, like a kind of the, the patriarchal heads of families, everyone from Adam to Jesus. It is unbelievably boring. Uh, and so like our script uh, took this genealogy sequence and kind of changed it into a dance, stage combat, pyrotechnic version, which was, which was very difficult to execute properly. When there is a mix of the two within one scene of those uh, who Barrett directs and those who Je Jessica directs, when there's a mix of the two within one scene, Barrett will direct Pontius Pilate, Maisie. Okay, sorry, that's my dog. Ah, I, sorry, that's the other person who has a real name in here or the other being who has a real name, Maisie. I, brought, I missed my dog, so I got her a role in the play. Uh, which in hindsight was wildly unprofessional. But anyways, Macy's the dog. <laughs> when there's a mix of the two within one scene, Barrett will direct Pontius Pilate, Maisie, and me. While Jessica takes charge of wealthy haired guests one through three and my entourage of attendants. The result of this division, whether intentional or not, is that there's a prestige to working with Barrett, that you matter. Working with Jessica, on the other hand, means you are a nobody, a realization that hits hard for those who assumed otherwise. We need more energy from all of you, Jessica tells her actors. A Galilean man crouches down to scratch his sheep's ears. The sheep baas and the Galilean man does too, both of them drowning out their director. I ask if Barrett, in writing the script, Barrett's also the the playwright. I asked Barrett if in writing the script, he most valued narrative development or biblical accuracy. Narrative, he says. Wait, I say. What? He nods. I had so expected him to say biblical accuracy, I am caught without a follow-up. I didn't think you'd just admit that, I say. He nods again. Because, I say, even the most liberal actors here thinks that, think that's wrong. He smiles. Not a lot, but it's there. That, he says, is why they need me. Throughout the Passion Play's life, Barrett has been around for longer than he hasn't. In 2004, after the birth of his eldest daughter, now cast as Blind Woman's Child, Barrett relinquished his command of a touring theater troupe and joined the passion play in the role of Lazarus. The following year, the director of the show offered him the position of assistant director. Since then, he has steadily risen through the ranks until he now basically is the passion play, much like how Julius Caesar became synonymous with Rome. Last season, when Vance, Vance is like the guy that runs the whole, the whole thing, the executive director. Last season, when Vance granted Barrett's demand of the directorship, Barrett insisted that Jessica return alongside him. Now, he not only is the playwright and head of the directorial team, sorry, I lost my stuff, head of the directorial team, but also enjoys the full support of some of the play's most vociferous volunteers. Simon Peter calls him his captain. The Virgin Mary rests her head upon his shoulder. Wealthy haired guest too says he is phantominal, even though that is not a word. During snack break, Diablos speaks of him with deified reverence. 
did you see him catch that football? He asked me after a rehearsal during which Barrett intercepted a pass from one dark angel to another. Just incredible. But even Caesar fell. In the corner of the armory's entrance, Pontius Pilate recently told me, in all my years at the Passion Play, I've never seen the cast so frustrated and divided. He was in his armor, but wearing his fedora, and the armory's lone light bulb cast a film noir shadow across his eyes. So many angry people. With a full month of rehearsals remaining, Judas won't even speak with Barrett anymore. The rough and tumble scenic arts crew openly mocks him. The entire wardrobe department are so upset that when we last went to Boston Pizza, they ranted against him until the manager, having already mopped, stacked the chairs, and turned off the AC, finally begged us to leave. Yet most worrisome to Barrett's security is the whole township of villagers, the plebeian mass of the cast that avoid him entirely, either out of fear or suspicion or utter apathy. Uh, I, I will stop there. I just wanted to uh, say thank you again very much for having me. It's a real honor to be included with the, these other esteemed authors, Sharon, Naomi, on, on this list, and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. It, it was great to hear you read. Uh, it was great to hear you read that. Thanks. And uh, and congratulations as well on your uh, on your. Thank you. And Naomi, last but not least. There she is. Okay, I'm going to introduce Naomi K. Lewis. Writes, edits, and teaches creative writing in Calgary. She was an associate editor at Alberta Views Magazine and has served as writer-in-residence at the Calgary Public Library and the University of New Brunswick. Her previous books include the novel Crick in a Fist, the short story collection I Know Who You Remind Me Of, and the anthology Shy, which she co-edited with Rona Altros. Tiny Lights for Travelers was also a finalist for the Governor General's Award for Nonfiction and is shortlisted for the W.O. Mitchell City of Calgary Book Prize and the Pink Sea is a Javon or Given Family Prize for Nonfiction, a category of the West. Naomi. Hi. How are you? How are you? Uh, good. How are you? Good. Um, so t tell us, uh, tell everybody about this, this book, uh, mem is memoir an accurate description? It is an accurate description. It is a memoir. Um, it is about a trip I took in the summer of 2015 when, um, my, I had a journal, just a 30 page typed journal that my grandfather had written in the summer of 1942 and that my parents found in, um, after his death. Uh, not that long before I went on the trip. And it recounted his escape from German-occupied Netherlands. Um, he was Jewish, and so he had to get out of the country. His brother went into hiding, and his mother um, ended up being arrested and killed in a concentration camp. So he was the one who left. And um, this was a story that I always knew, kind of, but not really the details because he never talked about it. So this journal kind of let my family see exactly what he went through during just that very short time of traveling from Amsterdam to the southern France. And so I decided to take the same trip that he'd taken. Um, so I took his journal and I went to Amsterdam um, where he's from and where my mother's from and then traveled on the same dates to the same towns and tried to kind of follow the same route and take the same trains if I could and stuff like that. And then I used that as a frame to write more generally about um, a whole bunch of stuff, basically. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and the passage that you're going to read uh, tonight, what, what particularly um, is that about? Um, so I'm reading from near the beginning, not quite the beginning of, of my book. And um, I'm reading about... Well, introducing one of the kind of complications that made my trip um, extra difficult. I think okay. that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> yeah. So okay, shall I'll I? Take it away. Okay. 
I wanted to ask Oma, oh, I should tell you, I called my grandparents Oma and Opa. So Opa was my grandfather who um, had the journal and took the trip. And Oma was my grandmother who was married to Opa. Um, Opa, of course, was Dutch and Oma was actually British. I wanted to ask Oma what she thought, what she thought about everything, about the breakup of my marriage. Oh, sorry. You know what? I just started in the wrong place. I'm going to start somewhere else. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. Um, so at this part, I'm actually talking to my friend, Yale, who's a kind of a main character, um, someone who I'm always talking to throughout the book. You should do it, my friend Yale had said when I told her about my idea to follow Opa's route out of Holland, taking the same trip on the same dates. We were talking on Skype, and it was late for me in Calgary, mid-morning for her in Singapore. I've been feeling like I should do something different. Get out of here for a while, I said. No kidding. You've had the kind of year that gives people breakdowns. Maybe, she added, you could see this trip as an ending to that year, a kind of reset. It had been slightly over a year since my marriage broke up. In the aftermath, following a manic kind of compulsion, I'd run headlong into a reckless dating streak. Meanwhile, I'd worked multiple jobs at once to keep the condo, which also meant I dropped the ball on the short story collection I'd meant to write. It sounds like, like a significant thing to do, following my grandfather's footsteps, but I don't think he would have liked it, I said. He would have thought it was stupid, and I don't know what I could possibly find or get out of it. It's not going to be the thing that finally explains me to myself, you know? Yes, she agreed. Canadians really need to stop going back somewhere to find their roots. Yeah, I'll emphasize for irony the back and the roots. I told myself I wasn't looking for anything as misguided as roots. I'd made that mistake when I married my ex, as though his sense of tradition could bloom in me and through me, connecting me to a network of people and meaning from which I'd been cruelly severed. I tried, but nothing had grown in me. Nothing had taken hold. If I was looking for anything now, I had no idea what it was. You should do it, she repeated, for your opa. You loved him, and this would be a way of going back and facing what he couldn't face himself. But he really wouldn't have wanted me to. He didn't even mean me to find the journal. Well, he didn't throw it out. He kept it for 70 years. Why would a person do that if they really didn't want their story to be known? And anyway, you see you always wanted to find a secret diary and then follow the map inside. You have to. And look, it doesn't have to mean anything or facilitate any epiphanies. It doesn't have to be anything more than it is. I should, I said. I really should go. But I couldn't imagine actually doing it. I loved Opa, yes. I'd had one of those years, it was true. And I was about to turn 40, and I could actually afford a two-week trip, thanks to money I'd inherited from Opa himself. I'd longed throughout my childhood to find a diary, a map just like I'd longed to fall through a wardrobe into a wintry wood or drive a car back in time. But I loved those stories as, as stories. What I hated then and now was traveling. I had moved often enough, but could only appreciate each place by living there, by staying, by not traveling. A new place was a site of torment for me, at least until I saw a familiar face, which I watched from that moment on. I followed that face as a lantern bobbing through roiling black wilderness. I did this gently, walking beside, not behind, hoping my travel companion wouldn't notice. I had no idea where we were, or where we were going, or how we got there, or how we might get back to where we began, wherever that might be. I didn't get lost. I started lost and remained lost, and I don't mean a bad sense of direction. I had only recently learned about developmental topographical disorientation, identified by a researcher of all places. People with DTD couldn't form cognitive maps, were always lost, despite having no brain damage or neurological condition to explain it. When I called the researcher to interview him, I told him how I'd often missed classes in high school because I couldn't find them even after three or four years at the same school, and told him that I still took exactly the same route every time I went for a walk or run, because otherwise I'd spend the whole time in a panic. Nothing familiar, afraid I'd never find my way back home. As a child back in the DC suburb, I once hesitated on my own street, unable to identify my house, 
and then took a guess and walked into the wrong one. As an adult, I didn't drive because I couldn't trust myself to navigate the lanes on a highway, let alone the streets of a city. And I watched from the passenger seat in complete bafflement every time a driver friend performed the feats required to get in or out of a parking lot. The professor at U of C said, yes, it sounded possible that I had DTD, though he couldn't diagnose me over the phone. If I did have DTD, he said, it wasn't as severe as for some people who couldn't even find the bathrooms in their longtime homes. People with DTD, he explained, have no brain damage or malformation, but the brain's hippocampus and prefrontal cortex fail to work together to form cognitive maps. Unlike brain damaged patients, DTD sufferers are lost from childhood on, even in places that should be familiar. Without cognitive maps, navigation depends entirely on memorizing landmarks and sequences. And we can only hold so much, turn right at the lamppost, turn left at the blue house in our heads. We can't see the big picture. We're lost. After we spoke, I took the tests on the website and failed the cognitive map formation section spectacularly. Like anyone with an embarrassing lifelong deficiency named and normalized, I was elated. That night, yeah, all this morning, I messaged her, told her the big news about my cognitive disability, and waited for her to congratulate me. I loved the idea that I might have DTD, even loved its poetic name, developmental topographical disorientation, and its other less precise designators, which also include people rendered lost by brain damage, geographic agnosia, topographic agnosia, and place blindness. Yes, oh yes, place blindness. Place, place blindness spun in circles and then thrust forward. I have DTD, I reminded Yale. I'll get lost. Well, you should still go, she said. I promise you won't get lost. You'll have GPS on your phone. And if you do get lost, just take a taxi back to your hotel. I booked the ticket to Amsterdam. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much. I was <laughs> and uh, everybody agrees. Everybody, everybody else in the audience here agrees. Um, <laughs> I I wanted to thank the three of you uh, for for agreeing to to do this virtual reading. I know things can't uh, you know aren't always perfect with uh, web hookups and all that kind of stuff, but I thought this was this was fantastic. It was also great. Uh, the Writers Guild does a reading event in, in Calgary with the finalists and a reading event in Edmonton. And um, since you're all closer to Calgary, I probably wouldn't have even gotten to see to see that event uh, anyway. So it was nice. I got a I got a private show in my own in my own house. So thank you very much for that. Thank and you. Um, as well, I just I wanted to say thank you for including me, which I didn't say before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> And uh, I was going to give people, uh, I, th I thought if there was a spot for a question or two, if people wanted to type it in, but other, uh, if not, uh, I'm going to keep my eye on that chat. But if not, um, you you can't see what I'm seeing, but lots of people are saying, thank you very much. Brava, lovely reading. Thank you. Every, you know, so um, if you're on <laughs> Facebook, you can, you can go back and, and <laughs> see the, the nice messages that, that people are leaving you. Uh, Peter Midgley says, I love this story. Um, let's just give it one more second. Um, but otherwise, um, it's hard to do two things at once. I'm sure I'm like looking at two screens. You get two computers and put them together. Um, but we'll just leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much for spending some time uh, with with me this evening and and for uh, for doing this reading. It's going to be. Um, it's going to be up on Facebook for a while and through our website. So lots of people will be able to, to, uh, have a listen and, and uh, get a taste of, of these stories if they, if they haven't heard them yet. Um, and, uh, congratulations again to all three of you for, for your, uh, for your achievement this year. And, and, um, we won't be seeing you in person for the, for the gala, but, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully sometime soon. Thank you. Take care, everybody. <laughs>